Welcome to the Red Roof Recovery Show, a program to soften the path of recovery from substance and behavior addictions. And you know what? It's not just about addictions. It's about life. I want to first thank Russell Allen Scott for writing this beautiful piece of music. It's called Greatest Bravery. It's such an appropriate theme song for this show as well because it has taken a great deal of bravery for me to come out of the proverbial closet and start publicly speaking about my addictions to drugs and alcohol. But like I said, this program is about far more than addictions. It's about life and the messiness of life. That includes mental health disorders like addiction and how we can better manage those things in our life. My name is Tanya McIntyre. I'm grateful to have you here. I appreciate you spending the next 30 minutes with me as I share the experience that I have managed to acquire over the past dozen years that I have been gratefully sober. I use a variety of tools and techniques that I'll be sharing with you on each episode of the Red Roof Recovery Show because there are literally hundreds of ways that you can approach life and recovery and managing life and recovery. And I think the key is to just keep looking until you find something that resonates with you. I often say to people, even when they're going to 12-step meetings and with the stigma that's attached around the anonymity and the God factor of AA, there are lots of meetings. Every meeting is different. I resonate with some meetings. I don't resonate with others. So it's the key, I think, is just to try, keep trying and find something that clicks for you. Certainly a key for me that clicked when it comes to managing my mental health disorders like addictions is acceptance. You will hear me talk about this all the time, how important it is to accept myself unconditionally, accept others unconditionally, and accept life unconditionally. And I am thrilled to have with us on this episode of the Red Roof Recovery Show an expert in rational emotive behavior therapy. You have heard me talk about REBT all the time on these shows. And now we have Dr. Walter Matwichuk with us to share some of his insights around this topic of ac acceptance. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Dr. Matt Wichuk. I'm a little nervous about this. He's an American psychologist in Pennsylvania, and I listen to Dr. Matt Wichuk every week. He does a, a conversation hour on Zoom. I'm grateful to be in this era of digital technology where we can all be connected so easily. Dr. Matt Wichuk is a unique practitioner of cognitive behavior therapy, which has certainly been instrumental in my own recovery from drug and alcohol addictions. Dr. Matt Wichuk has worked closely with both Dr. Albert Ellis and Dr. Aaron Beck, two of the founding fathers of cognitive behavior therapy. Dr. Matt Wichuk, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be with us. Oh, it's great to be here. I love talking about cognitive, <clears throat> excuse me, cognitive behavior therapy and REBT. So let's get cracking. You are so good at it because when I join your conversational hours every Saturday, and I encourage people to do that, to go to your website, rebtdoctor.com and sign up for your newsletter. And your just your website is just a wealth of information and resources. So people can sign yeah. up to join that weekly conversational hour because I always learn so much from that. I've been a volunteer on the show and I've sent some friends your way to be volunteers. And they have definitely come to some pretty significant aha moments so dr matt well you know um no go ahead it's it's um it's it my goal is to disseminate uh this useful philosophy and when you use uh, when people volunteer and discuss a real problem not only am i helping them learn to apply this useful philosophy but others watch and they learn from so a lot of times i'll tell some of the people that i'm actively working with now why don't you watch on saturday so you add a different perspective when you're in the hot seat sometimes it's hard to um, learn it as well when you're watching somebody else try to struggle with these ideas and i love the fact that you do that that you record the sessions and send them to the volunteer because when i watched right. my session with you it was a whole different experience than, like you said, being in that hot seat because you're kind of like, you know, cognizant of all the judgment coming from the hundred or so people that are also watching the session. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, the judgment that probably impacts people the most is the self judgment that people tend to do. So mm -hmm. um, when you're, when you're, when you're in the hot seat, so to speak, it's not so hot. It's, it's really just a seat. And then you make <laughs> it hot by saying, I have to do perfectly well. And if I don't do perfectly well and impress all the people watching, then I'm lesser of a person. So what, when you watch 
yourself, um, it, it can make it a little easier. That self-critical talk isn't happening. Yeah, let's talk about that self-critical talk. You know, I often refer to the inner dialogue. I call it the committee in my head. It's just that negative narrative loop that just runs and runs and runs and never shuts up. And I, yeah. I talk about how rational emotive behavior therapy helps me to be aware of that narrative. I think that's awareness is the first step to progress. And then once I'm aware of it, I can make a cognitive effort to intercept it and feed it with more positive, helpful uh, attitudes and beliefs. Am I on track doing yeah. that? Yeah, I think so. But I would put it differently. I would say that it's not so much that I'm encouraging people to insert positive attitudes and beliefs, but realistic attitudes and beliefs. So, for example, when we say I did poorly, I just was talking to somebody who said, you know, I'm a failure and I'm depressed. And I said, well, you know, it's true. The evidence shows that you have failed. You're not doing as well as these other people that you're talking about. But that doesn't make you a failure. So that's not, when we say I failed, that's not positive. That's actually realistic and a realistic assessment of things. But then when you, when you go to I'm a failure, well, now you're negative. Whereas you could say I failed, yes, but that proves I'm a fallible human. Now let me rate it, my, my behavior, and then see what I could do about it and, and accept myself. No, I'm, so I'm not teaching people positive thinking so much as realistic thinking. Realistically, you're a fallible human. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm a facilitator with something called SMART, self-management and recovery training. Um, that is and also a great program. It is a great program, isn't it? And, um, you know, founded on principles of CBT, REBT. And we often talk about unconditional self-acceptance. Um, and I love the fact that SMART uh, recommends that we don't label ourselves. In recovery, we don't call ourselves alcoholic or addict or junkie or druggy or loser or whatever the label is because we are not our addictions. But it also says in unconditional uh, self acceptance that we are not our behavior. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that because I think we are well, our I would behavior. Agree with, well, you see, I would disagree. I, okay. I think that we are humans who behave, emote, think feel and and so none of these different thoughts feelings and behaviors represent us we are we have aliveness and then we do things and sometimes people will take a subset of what they've done so say their self-defeating behavior of drinking to excess or something like that and then use it to define them and so doing that is really pernicious and, and counterproductive. And so I would argue that, that you are you and you do different things. None of those behaviors make you. Now, you're responsible for what you do. But if you say, I am what I do, then you have a conditional sense of self-acceptance, where if you say, I am a person and I do many different things and I accept myself when I do well or when I do poorly, then you have unconditional self-acceptance. And so uh, unconditional self-acceptance is healthier because when, because you're fallible, you're going to do poorly eventually. And if you say, I am what I do, and you then do poorly, you're going to feel pretty bad as, as a person where you could say, I'll be, I'm disappointed with what I've done. But my, that behavior doesn't represent the whole of me. It only represents a part of me, that behavior, which I did today. So it's not so much a moral failing. It's being aware of the behavior and having a willingness to correct it. And you don't have to have a willingness to correct it. In, in all probability, absolutes don't exist. So if you want to continue to do um, self-destructive behavior, that's okay. It's your life. But... Um, if you wish to um, um, live for both today and tomorrow, it would be in your best interest to either preferably slow down or eliminate your, your self-defeating behavior. So no, I don't think it's a moral failing. Um, you could drink yourself to death if you wish. It's your life. You could do with it what you want. Do you encourage people to try to answer the question, who am I? No. Um, because we know who you are. You're Tanya McIntyre, 
And I'm Walter Matwichuk. What I would uh, encourage people to do is ask the que- a couple of different questions like, well, what do I want to do with the one life I'm likely ever to have? And how do I want to um, expend my efforts in what domains of my life? Um, what, how can I maximize the pleasure in my life? How can I maximize the meaning in my life? But asking who you are, um, in my view, is a, not a very useful question to ask. So when we're looking for meaning, to even maximize the meaning in our life, if people are feeling a lack of meaning, where can we start to help them find it? Well, we could start by experimenting. Um, what gives you meaning and what gives me meaning are probably very different things. Although my guess is they're probably similar in our case because you like talking about helping people recover from addictions and I like helping people not only do that, recover from addictions, but also do other things, overcome depression or overcome marital problems, overcome um, problems of fears and self-limiting fears. And so um, the best way to find meaning is to experiment. And what gives a person meaning, like for example, what gave Steve Jobs meaning and um, was is different than what gives me meaning. Um, his his meaning was expressed through the development of technology. So experiment. It doesn't. In REBT, we call this vitally absorbing interests. I like to call them missions. So I have a mission to disseminate REBT, the philosophy that I find useful. But other people might have the mission of working with the homeless or have the mission of saving animals or have the mission of persuading people to pick up litter. It doesn't matter. Or have the mission of building a business or political activism or, you know, or you could have multiple missions. So the best way to figure out is to experiment. Um, If I had more time, I would experiment with painting and music and learning to play the piano, but I don't have more time. So I don't do those experiments, but I would say if you want meaning, experiment with what you think will give you meaning and then see if it does. If it doesn't, do another experiment. Try something else. Yeah, I think that's important to to open ourselves to the diversity that's offered. And I love the the fact that you you mentioned the VACI, the V-A-C-I. Uh, Smart uses that as well as, as one of their tools, the vital absorbing creative interest. And when we're encouraged to actually explore those interests and rate them, for instance, so uh, something like rock climbing, I put that on my list. So I rated it. I thought I might like it um, from a scale of one to 10, one being least likely to like it and 10 being most likely to like it. I thought I might range maybe two or three because I can't imagine because I don't have upper body strength to pull myself up a wall to begin with, but people seem to really enjoy it. And it looks like a lot of fun. So I wanted to go out and try it. And I went out and tried it. And definitely, um, if there was a zero, it would be a zero for me. Because after I tried it, it's like it has absolutely no level of uh, fulfillment and joy for me at all. It was just a lot of work. And uh, I also didn't like... And you could either jump to the conclusion that nothing will give you meaning or you could do another experiment and try painting or piano or dancing or tango or whatever. Exactly. Or help, helping the homeless or picking up litter or political activism. or It doesn't matter what it is. As long as it's not antisocial and self-destructive, a vitally, your vitally absorbing interest or interest will be different than mine. And the way you discover them is by doing them. So we're hearing a lot when of... When I was a kid. When you were what? When I was a kid, I used to play a lot of baseball, and I would do that all the time. But now I don't do that anymore. I used to run marathons. I don't do that anymore. So what you do at one stage of your life for vitally absorbing interests are different than what you do at another. Yeah, my philosopher dad always said, learn to love all that you are and resign with good grace all that you're not. <laughs> so I like the fact that you keep reminding us that we are... Fallible humans always in flux. Yeah, I think of people like uh, puzzles, like a 5,000 or maybe even more than that, a million piece puzzle. And and there are all these different parts and you pick a few of the parts that you want to work on and you might like some other parts and then you work on the parts. But the whole is unrateable because it's too many parts, it's complex, it's 
it's in a state of flux and really people try to do it, but that's just sloppy thinking that ends up leaving you anxious or depressed. How much are the cognitive distortions um, a crucial element when it comes to rational emotive behavior therapy? When I'm going through group they're exercises, really, yeah, I, I like to... Yeah, they're really down... I'm sorry. I like to compare the thoughts that people are having, you know, and, and they're called irrational. I prefer to call them unhelpful because uh, I think when we're having the thoughts, it's rational to us. So to call it irrational is not helpful in the beginning. But we need to examine the thoughts that we're having around certain adversities in life. And the, I find the best way to examine the thoughts around adversities is to compare them to the common uh, list of cognitive distortions, those unhelpful beliefs like all or nothing thinking and jumping to conclusions and labeling. See, I don't use those much. And I'll tell you why. Because humans have different types of thoughts. They have what are called inferences, which are or automatic thoughts, which like, for example, I'm going to do poorly. That's an inference. It's a prediction, an assumption, whatever, a hypothesis. But then we have basic attitudes, which are deeper level cognitions. They too are thoughts. So the word thought is like a generic word, like liquid. But then there's coffee, there's tea, there's uh, cola, there's beer, there's wine. And so they're all different types of thoughts. And the cognitive distortions that you're referring to, that list of them, they're useful for targeting to change. Black and white thinking, fortune telling, magnific magnemizing, minimizing, um, personalizing, emotional reasoning. All those things are useful. But in my view, they're not primary. They're a product of deeper level cognitions like I have to do ideally well, you have to treat me nicely and the world has to be a safe, easy and predictable place. And, and so it's from these deeper level cognitions that these inferences, these cognitive distortions tend to result, they stem from them. But I actually, as an irrationally motivated behavior therapist, go for the, the, the deeper level cognition. So I look past the, I'm going to fail, which is an inference, and go to the deeper level cognition, I have to succeed. And then, and then I, I talked about that idea that, well, do you have to succeed? And if you don't succeed, what does that mean? It means you're a fallible human. Whereas when you're talking about cognitive distortions, you're talking about higher level inferences, which in my, it's kind of like pulling out the, the dandelions on your lawn. Unless you get, get deep down and pull out the root of the dandelion, the thing will grow back. And so the thought, I'm going to fail, is going to come back unless you get to the bottom, which is, I have to succeed. Hmm. Different levels of cognitions. And, 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 and cognitive therapists, a la Beck and Burns, will get to them. But they'll get to them later on rather than REBT really starts at that deeper level. And then as an afterthought, we go back and say, well, is it really likely that you're going to fail? But you see, by assuming it to be temporarily, tr temporarily true that you will fail, it allows you to look past that to the deeper level cognition. So I'll, I said to a man earlier today, he said, you know, like I, I, my bad temper injured, uh, probably damaged my daughter's development. I said, well, let's, I don't know you very well, but let's temporarily assume that to be true. Now, how are you making yourself feel guilty and is the guilt help you? Well, the answer to the guilt helping him was no. And then the attitude that was leading him was, well, because I damaged my daughter through my expressions of anger and played my roles of father poorly, I am lesser of a person. So we use the inference to kind of take a deep dive down for the core problem, which was this idea that I have to play my role perfectly well or, le or else I'm lesser of a person. Mm. Yeah, guilt and shame seem to be common threads in recovery circles. I hear it all the time. And, you know, we have a couple of exercises to work through on it because, you know, sometimes there can be helpful guilt um, not sure about the shame aspect, however, because well, I would argue, I would argue, you could use healthy guilt as or helpful guilt and distinguish it from unhealthy guilt or un 
helpful guilt. But I prefer to talk about remorse as being the healthy word, the healthy emotional state for acknowledging that you've misbehaved, maybe hurt other people, and guilt being the unhealthy version. But it doesn't matter what the label, it, it's the distinction between an emotion that helps you change what you can change, or an emotion that's self-condemning. And guilt and shame essentially are self-condemning emotions, whereas remorse and disappointment are self-helping, not self-condemning. They acknowledge that you've made a prattful in the case of shame that's been publicly displayed, and in the case of guilt, that you've broken some sort of moral rule or some ethical rule. But remorse says, I've broken the rule, but I'm not a, a, a bad person. I'm a fallible human. Condemn the sin, not the sinner. Mm. Now, some models of um, recovery and therapy don't concentrate so much on the past because there's not a ha whole heck of a lot we can do to change anything from the past. Uh, so it's about starting from today and how we're going to move forward. Do, do you agree with that? I don't know. I think some some stuff from the I past needs to be sorted before we can take that step forward? Well, I, 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 it depends. Um, I think that what I would say, put it is this way, that if people are troubled in the present by events of the past, then it's important to talk about our current attitudes about past events. So the focus is on your present attitude about a past event because what you're you're living in the present but you're thinking about the past and the way you think about the past can either allow you to have a healthy reaction to it or an unhealthy reaction to it and so if you're having an unhealthy emotion about your past behavior or behavior that other people have done to you like in the case of a person who's been abused what we want to do is help you develop, cultivate a healthy attitude in the present about a past event. So again, we're talking about a past event, but we're talking about it from the standpoint of our current attitude. So when people say cognitive behavior therapies talk about pre the present, I think they're, they're being very vague. What I do as an REBT therapist is talk about current attitudes about either past events present events or future events. Because think about when you talk about the future. You're not, you don't know the future, but you're talking about your current attitude towards a possible future event. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a saying, isn't there? If you want to have anxiety, get yourself a future. If you want to have depression, get yourself a past. <laughs> Because that seems to be... I would say, I would modify, tweak that a little bit. Okay. I think you're right. Anxiety is a future-oriented emotion, and depression is more of a past-oriented uh, uh, emotion. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that it's get yourself an attitude about the future or an attitude about the past that then creates anxiety or depression. So it's the attitude in the present that dictates how you feel about the past or the present. So it's about dissecting our attitudes and doing, what, thought processes to reframe that attitude and belief? No, I, I don't like the word reframe because that, again, suggests more of work at the level of an inference. Like, for example, if I, if I said, I'm going to fail people could reframe that to, I'm going to possibly fail. But what we're doing, what I'm doing as an REBT psychotherapist, is, again, is going to a, taking a deeper dive and looking to cultivate a healthy attitude towards the possibility of failure. So I help people transform rigid and extreme attitudes, which lie at the core of disturbance that's self-defeating, and teach them how to first identify those rigid and extreme attitudes and then reflect upon them, look at the utility, whether they're yielding good results or bad results, to look at the validity, whether there's evidence to support them or, or doesn't, or they're not supported by evidence, look at their internal logic, and then through that process, which we call disputing, but you can call it whatever you want, um, transform the attitude, tweak it into a healthier attitude. 
So, for example, if I said to you, I absolutely should not have spent my younger years smoking lots and lots of pot, right? That was a waste of time and money, and I didn't use my years, my younger years well, right? I could say to you, well, is that yielding you good results now? And the person might say, well, yeah, it's yielding me good results. It's, it's making me feel guilty, and that's helping me change. And I would say, well, you could change just as well by acknowledging that you wasted time in the past and be remorseful about that and concerned about the implications for your health now. Um, but you would get better results. You would get equally or if not better results. Um, and you could have the person look at the evidence that supports the idea that you absolutely should not have smoked all that pot. And, and people will say, I'll say, well, where's the evidence? And they'll say, well, the evidence is that I would say have gotten through uh, school better or gotten a better job or uh, I wouldn't have lost a marriage. And I say, no, that's not evidence that you absolutely should not have smoked all that pot. What that is evidence is of, it's evidence of the fact that it would have been far better if you hadn't smoked that pot. But you see, what people do is they think that what's better is evidence of what absolutely should not have occurred. And I always say to people, look, there's no law of the universe that says we have to do what's better. There is a law of the universe that says there's gravity. And, 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 and so the universe permits us to uh, not do what's better, but it doesn't permit us to violate the law of gravity. So you absolutely, when you say I absolutely shouldn't have done that, it's false to the facts, and people don't see that until, it, until it's explained over and over again. It would have been better had you not smoked all that pot, because maybe you'd still have that marriage, or you would have gotten through school. Fantastic. What a wonderful way to end this extraordinary 30 minutes. Dr. Matt Wachuk, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Well, it's been a pleasure, and thank you for having me, and I hope you to you visit my website, rebtdoctor.com. Absolutely, we will. You can connect with Dr. Matt Wichuk through his website, rebtdoctor.com. And be sure to sign up to join his weekly conversations on Zoom. They are an instrumental part of my routine. They contribute greatly to my motivation to maintain abstinence from harmful substances and behaviors. I just love everything that Dr. Matt Wichuk does. So... Be sure to tune in 9 o'clock on Saturdays, and you can sign up at rebtdoctor.com. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matt Wachuk. Keep up your brilliant work. Thank you. Same to you. Keep up the battle. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tanya McIntyre. I want to thank you for being here with us today. You are an integral part of my recovery journey, and I appreciate you spending part of your day with me. I've authored a couple of books. Uh, please look them up. They are in honor of my philosopher dad, Mindful Wisdom from My Philosopher Dad. And my second book is Daily Wisdom from My Philosopher Dad. I set this one up like a journal. So I encourage you to uh, have a look at the inspirational messages every day and then write your thoughts and intentions for the day. Uh, in my experience, uh, the power of words is extremely powerful. The power of the written word when we get all the senses involved with the writing, uh, that can be magical and sometimes life transformational. It certainly has been for me. My wish for you is to always live fully, laugh often, love always, stay mindful and as positive as possible. Uh, remember, there's great power in knowing that the only thing we can control in our life is ourselves. So let's remember to talk to ourselves like we talk to our best friends. May the force be with you. And remember... You are the force.